Welcome to Guy Code, a podcast dedicated to imparting dad wisdom to my son with your host, Koji Steven Sakai and friends. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Koji and this is episode 29. I wanted to impart all my wisdom to my son, but of course my son already thinks he knows more than me. So instead of trying to tell him, now and having it go one ear and out the other ear, I decided to record them here with the hopes that maybe, just maybe, when he's ready, he'll listen to my advice in the future and not make the same stupid mistake I made. I'll also bring on guests to impart their advice as well. I have no doubt their advice will be better than mine. So this week I brought on my friend and producing partner, Quinton Lee. Hi, Quinton. How are you? Oh, I'm good, thank you. What Quinton, does guy code mean? Guy code. Guy code is like the, uh, it's like a code that, that men have amongst each other. Right? Oh, okay. Like, uh, like you won't date somebody that you like, or you won't tell on somebody, that kind of thing. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Quentin? Well, I'm, I'm right now, I'm a director and a producer. And uh, I originally grew up in Hong Kong until I was 15. Then I moved to Canada and Montreal. I went to high school there, grade 11, grade 12. Then I went to Berkeley for college, uh, studying English. Um, because I didn't get a film school for UCLA. Then I, after I graduated, I tried getting, getting into UCLA film school again. I got rejected again. So I decided that I was going to take a, a one year off, a one year away from film by going to uh, Yale University for a degree, a master's, a one year master's in English, um, which was a lot of fun, actually. Um, then after that, I applied to UCLA film school again, and I was waitlisted. So I thought, you know what, I got to USC three times, so might as well go to USC. And then on my first day of school at USC, um, UCLA called me and I switched over to UCLA because there was a film student from USC that switched to US, US there's a film student from UCLA that switched to USC, who was also an Asian guy. <laughs> and, and then I, you know, and the spot opened for me, so I went over to UCLA and canceled my check. Wow. And then since then, I've been making films, and I, start, I made my first feature with Justin Lin um, in 1996 called Shopping for Fans. It actually premiered at Toronto Film Festival in 1997, and then just basically been making films since 1997, 96 or something. Yeah. And you're a father. Uh, how old is, how old is your, kid, your son? Uh, my son is four years old. Four years old, so still a baby. That's a good age. Okay, uh, why don't we get into this? Why don't we get into some advice? Uh, I think we're doing general life advice. Why don't you tell us any kind of advice you might have? What's your first advice you have? For what? For, for uh, anything, any kind of advice. Do you have any advice you want to share to, to my son, to your son, to any son or child or person? Well, I think like, because I think I've always been asked to give, be given advice on like film stuff. Like okay. basically, um, the thing is that you just can't wait for somebody to give you an opportunity. You know, whether you're an, an artist or you're a filmmaker or you are anybody, a, a business person, or even Donald Trump, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting that particularly recently I looked at kind of like how Donald Trump became president of the United States. I thought it was very interesting because he was going to run as a Democrat in the 90s. And obviously looking at a Democrat, you know, Democrat Party, you realize that they would never give Donald Trump, not Donald Trump a chance. So he switched over to the Republican Party and ran, ran obviously, four years ago. And he, no one wanted him either because the Republicans hated him too. And somehow he was able to beat both the Democrats' party and the Republican Party and became the president of the United States. I thought that was very interesting. Despite I don't agree with his politics, I thought that was a very interesting phenomenon. So again, if you look at our president and you look at, wow, even Donald Trump, whom you thought could, could not have been a fit president, could become president of the United States. You can do anything in the United States. And you do not let anybody give you, you don't, you don't have to wait for anybody to give you a chance. Because if Donald Trump had waited to have anyone give him a chance to be a president, that would have never happened. He just did it. <laughs> and just like you make a film, you know, you're, you're a filmmaker, you're a director, and you know, you're one of your producer. You just gotta, you just gotta do it because no one is gonna give you a shot. And it's given, it's even though as equitable as we are in America, you know, no one would give Donald Trump a chance to become a president, but he did it on, on his own. And you look at that, you say, hey, you can do it on your own too, anything you want. If Donald Trump could become president of the United States, 
you could probably become president of the United States. You <laughs> tried. I mean, well, you have to be born here. I couldn't. So yeah, you have to be born here. I mean, he, he had a lot of money too, or he had a well, money. Not, look at Michael Bloomberg. What is he had more money? Yeah. What did he get? Did he do anything? No. <laughs> Why? Because because he's just he's you know it's like he spent like what did he spend like four hundred million already? On yeah. Yeah. Four hundred million dollars. You can run the studio. I mean, if had, had he put in like, you know, I, mean, I don't know why. Like he is so that rich. And what, what was Donald Trump's budget on uh, for president for, for presidency? It's like forty million something, right? Yeah, it wasn't something, that much. Something yeah. lot. It's like it's it's fifty percent less of Hillary Clinton. And it was like, wow, okay, well, impressive. Well, so again, it's like you have to think about alternative resources and how to outsmart the world, right? You know, because he was, you know, in some way that I think Hillary never thought that what well, technology was that important and she was just spending money getting Beyonce to sing and it didn't work, you know? And Donald Trump out, outsmarted him just making a deal with the Russians. Uh, they just uh, sent some cozy bear to like, you know, hack, hack the DNC, that works. Yeah. So again, like, you know, you have, you, don't, you know, you have to think about, there's no right, one way to do anything in America. There's no one way to do anything in the world. Now you look at, you know, you look at the head of Alibaba, you know, um, Jack Ma, right? He was like, you know, nobody would have thought he would become the Jack Ma that we know now. So I think that's what, that's what it is. It's just to have, you know, I think you have to live life without expectation and follow your heart, do whatever you want to do and don't take no for an answer and don't, let, don't wait for anyone to give you any opportunities. Otherwise, you would never do anything. I love, I love that piece of advice. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. That's it. I think, I think that's there, you know, just, just, you have to just do it, you know. And do you have any examples from your life where people said no to you and then you just did it and every it day, out? every day that's no to me. <laughs> it's like, if I listened to them, I would never become a filmmaker. I would never become a writer. I've gotten like, you know, since I was, I was writing since I was like, uh, I think I was, I was writing since I was like 13. Then I've gotten so many rejection letters until even I was 16 or something, 16, 17. I was getting a lot of rejection letters. And finally, there's this one publication that published a short story that I wrote and it's kind of like it's called Dark Star it's like a sci-fi weird sci-fi magazine and they published my first short story and that was my first publication and but that took what how many like at least like 50 rejections you know yeah wait what was that short rejection story? slips what was that what? short story about it was actually just very sci-fi it was just about this kid who was trying to escape to this clearing in the woods and in the clearing in the woods he becomes very imaginative and he was i forgot what the story was about i can remember <laughs> <laughs> my second i think my second short story was published by rafu shimpo because oh really uh, i came down actually no actually i think that my third or fourth and, and anyway so I, I wrote a story about a family eating snake soup for every 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 winter in hong kong so so it was a, a, a movie about it was a short a short story about eating like snake soup. And that was like published by, uh, I think Naomi Hirahara or something. I think that was one of those short story competition too. Oh, the Little Tokyo. I won like a hundred bucks, but I don't know if it was in Little Tokyo though. That wasn't Little Anyways, Tokyo. It was just, they just published oh. it, I guess, you know. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, so that was uh, my, my, I think my second short story published. Then, then I was in college and then I started public, getting published a little bit more. Um, well, what, what other, uh, do you have any other advice? You wanted to share any other advice, career or personal or anything that you live by codes or something that you're trying to teach uh, your son. Um, hmm. You know, I, I think like, like, you know, it's hard to say like that because I think when you think about someone giving an advice, it's always about, it's a very one dimensional kind of thing. And, and what I learned about parenting is really not to do that kind of thing because if somebody doesn't get, that somebody does not ask you for advice, I would never give an advice because that's always finds it really annoying. Yeah. And just like, I think, I think really, really it, it's just, just do it. Don't wait for an opportunity to come about and, and also be yourself. I think it took many years for just even me to be comfortable about expressing who I really am. And I think being Chinese is Chinese growing up as, you know, Chinese in Hong, as a, as a you know, Asian person or Chinese person in Hong Kong, you realize the culture is very different than American culture because it's, it's more of like a hearer-based culture versus a, a, a speaker-based culture. Like America is a very speaker-based culture, which means that if you don't speak up for yourself and you don't get what you want, that is your problem. 
but in Hong Kong, it's a very hero-based culture. So, which means that you, 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 if you speak up, you say the wrong thing, it's totally your fault. So you don't really, it's, it's just like Japanese is much more hero-based culture, as you know. Yeah. So, so the whole idea of hero-based culture is that you, you have to, so a lot of times I have no idea. Like I, as a, I was growing up as a kid, I'm very confused all the time. It's like, I don't know why my friend, friends mad at me, usually about something that I said. <laughs> accidentally I mean, like, I and then you would not talk to them and then i just clearly remember i was like in, in elementary school or something and and actually in my actually in grade eight i was i was sitting beside this girl and she was basically bullied by the, her by the classes everybody called her like everybody called, she was she wasn't good looking but everybody called her like beauty so it's like a really nasty name and so i was just trying to nice to her i tried to, try to chat her up and then and then eventually I get, got called by my teacher and she said, Quentin, I want to ask you something. You have to stop like molesting your friend, your neighbor or something, because we're sitting together. I said, what do you mean? He's like, well, you always try to reach and you got to touch her and whatever. I said, I didn't do that. You know what? This is called like, you know, if, if, if you do a little bit more, it would be called rape. I said, I oh. did not do any of this thing. What are you talking about? So, so the idea is I have no, a lot of times like, you know, you're in a hero based culture, you, you don't know, you, you would have said something and you don't understand, you were just saying what you want to say. And somehow because you say it in the wrong context, you want the right time, people didn't want to hear it. And that becomes your problem. So, so if, if someone coming from a hero based culture to, to, to America or Canada or North America, which is more speaker based culture, that's just kind of like weird adjustment. So you're not, I was never really encouraged to speak my mind you were just always encouraged to hold everything, don't say anything, and listen, if you really absolutely feel like, okay, this is life and death situation, then you would have to make a remark. Otherwise, you just listen to your teacher. Yeah. But again, like, you know, it, it was like a big adjustment change for me and, and, and to, to be who you are, you know? So that sort of ties back into, like, I think being yourself is really important because um, I was, uh, I started dancing, I started dan dancing really late in life, like around mid thirties, and then I'm still dancing. I just remember one of the best advice that my dance teacher, Cindera, gave. Actually, she's also an actress. And she said, you know what? For like many years, I was a professional dancer, but I was, I was dancing. I wasn't comfortable with my body. I wasn't comfortable with being myself dancing. But as soon as I, be, I, I, I become comfortable with myself or I accepted myself and who I am, then my dance skills kind of like improves a lot. So there are a lot of people basically, even though you, you want to do something, you're passionate about something, you are not, you're not doing it. You're not being yourself kind of thing. And I think it's only in the past 10 years that I finally realized that, wow, that's, that is so important, you know. How does one, how does one become themselves? Or uh, how, uh, what's a good way for- I'm just basically trusting your instincts and pursuing what you feel that, you know, it is right to pursue, right? and I think an example is, for example, I, I wrote this vampire script back 20 years ago. And I thought, hmm, I wrote it. It was like, because there was a gay vampire, there's like all these multicultural vampires in it. It's just like really kind of like, you know, ahead of its time. And I, every time I show people, people go, oh my God, this is like the best thing I've ever read. But at the same time, there's no way to make it, you know? And then so recently I was basically watching a lot of Dracula movies. And I was watching Dracula movies like, None of these movies actually, very few of these Dracula movies is actually faithful to the novel or even like they just probably take the Dracula character and did whatever they want with it. Yeah. I thought, oh, I could do that too because Dracula sells, you know. So I, I put that whole Dracula angle back into my vampire script and it suddenly became a better script 20 years later. And this is just the right script for the right time because everybody's looking for diverse stuff. You know, you can have LGBTQ characters, you know, like back 20 years ago is not possible, right? Yeah. So now, so after 20 years, you're like, okay, well, that's what I mean. But at the same time, I wrote that piece of work the way that I really wanted to write it anyway, even though it never got made. <laughs> Finally, it might get made again. So, so again, like just, that's, that's one thing of being yourself, I think. Also, I think at the right time, it's really hard because, you know, you look at the time and culture, right? You know, it, it was just impossible. It was a lot harder to be even gay back 20 years ago, right? Back in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or so Asian. It, it, was like, it was something kind of new, like being Asian American. Or just, it's just impossible to even think about back like I was going to film school, you would write an Asian American script and nobody would even look at it. It's just, it's just, you would <laughs> never, it's just that you cannot submit it now, you know, yeah. but now it's a different story, right? 
but so I'm glad that I basically always stuck to what I believed in doing and, and, you know, and that, and that is just being yourself, I think, you know, cause I think I remember I went to dinner 10 years ago and I was sitting with one of the writer friends and he writes for house. Is that house? Yeah. House. Yeah. House. Yeah. So, and he said, he said this kind of off handed comment. I think he's Jewish. And he said, Oh, so when are you going to do something that's kind of like, you know, not your community based on, uh, you know, something like, uh, oh, why, when are you going to do something that's basically saying, why are you going to do something more mainstream or basically when are you doing something like, you know, beyond your community or something like that. Yeah. And, but just even that is like a, such an offhanded comment that I feel like hmm, I'm very annoyed at him. So basically he said, well, you should not be writing. Can you do something like more broad with white people in it? Right. Yeah. And I'm, ne- I'm glad that I never really sort of took his advice because, you know, this is a show I give him advice because, because again, like people give you all these wrong advice all the time. You know, yeah, I think most. So I basically still stuck to what I wanted to do, and it's like you know, I think that's the most important thing. Just doing something you want to do It's just like the the best thing in the world. For example, I just made this web series called so, sorry, this feature called Commissary, but it's shot. We just shot a web series. We just my friend and I just came together. It's so pure. I mean, we came together with this idea. We just shot it. We got all these actors involved, and we shot it out with absolutely no money, and just yeah. two of us made the whole show. And that is a, the best feeling that you can ever get. You know, that's most reward artistically because you just did exactly what you want to do, whatever you, you know, with the, the limited means that you have. And that's just so unapologetically artistic and that's what everybody should do. And that it's, again, like it's about being yourself. That's, you know, being yourself and just do it. You know, again, like if I have to wait for like, oh, I'm going to wait for like, I'm going to get, get like, you know, get a get a pre-sale from a distributor I have to make sure people like this and blah blah and then you know by the time COVID's over you never did anything <laughs> exactly well wh- how do you how do you foster that kind of believe in yourself do what inspires you um with with your son well I think I think dancing helped me a lot actually like dance like learning how to dance was very important because learning her because learning dancing is actually a very difficult skill and but at the same time it's difficult but at the same time so much of it is yourself because you're so afraid of doing it and finally the um one with dance instructor i remember I, he, she told me it's just like you know what i could teach you everything about the technicality of dance and you can be a very good technical dancer but i cannot teach you how to become confident you know that's what attitude is about if you don't have attitude and you dance hip pop you're not going to look good so it's it's about the self confidence that you just have to you just have to bring it, and you just have to learn to bring it. And 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 it's and and mostly look, you can do that by just going to a lot of classes and working really hard. You know, the more again, it's like by 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 make by basically improving your own skills, you improve your confidence, right? By doing more and more and more, and, and don't stop yeah. doing it, right? Wait, is your so son doing like, is your son doing dance? Uh, not. Before COVID, he was in Before college. COVID, oh, okay. Did he like it? And then, uh, he doesn't mind it. He likes it. He doesn't mind he it. He likes to move around. <laughs> it's, it's not really a real, real ballet class anymore. Yeah, but I just, just want to start around. him up early because ballet is the foundation of, of, of dance. So he has to learn a little bit to move yeah. on. But, but dancing in general is such a great, it's such a great activity um, just because first, I mean, why I like doing the dance class is because first you learn about, you, you know about all the, the most popular culture. It's like research. Like I can, the, the choreographer is always choreographed to the top songs, like the, the, the coolest songs ever. So you learn about, you, you, I, I learn, I have to keep up with my industry. I learn about what's hip for young people. And that's, yeah. that's the best thing. And then second, it's like, it's such a skill that's really difficult in terms of memory, memory and remembering the steps and stuff like that. So that's a, that's a ma- major skills there. And then you also, you learn about yourself because a lot of times doing physical activities, a lot, it's, whether it's surfing or dancing, whatever, it's, it's really about, you, you learn so much about who you are and your body. And it's just having this kind of unity between your body and trusting your body and trusting that, you know, you can will your body to do certain things. It's, it's also increase your confidence. Wow. Yeah. I, I can't dance at all. So I, I admire the fact that you're doing dance classes and, and but learn. I couldn't dance either. I just learned. It's been <laughs> but the thing is, it's fun. It's always, I just remember when I first started dance. I mean, I swear to God, I was, I'd be going to beginning hip hop classes. I'd be so scared in my car. And then all these times I feel like, you know what, I just rather go home and not dance. I would drive all the way to the studio. I was sitting on my car then I was really nervous and I would try to make all kinds of excuses just to go home. Yeah. Even though I really wanted to do it. And then, 
because I said, oh my God, everybody's so young. Cause I was 35, everybody's like, you know, in, in the teens and I'm just down to all these kids. And it's like, and then the more you think about it, the more it's like, oh yeah, I don't want to go to class, you know? And then, but finally I kept, I, I just kept on going, yeah, you got to go in, you know? Yeah. yeah. I was, yeah, that was like me in jujitsu is that I'm fighting these young guys or young people who are just kicking my butt. And a lot of times I'm trying to make excuses about not going because it's, it's humbling to have to get my butt kicked all the time. But eventually, you know, I learned and I got better at it. But, but I love, I love your advice about being, being yourself. I love your advice about being, you know, pushing and not taking no for an answer. Um, I think you might be the first person who talked about Donald Trump on, on this podcast. So I appreciate really? it. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't think anybody. I think he's him. an interesting, fascinating character. So like, I don't know. It's like lately it's been bothering me a lot just because I think like the anti-Trumpers are like as worse as like the, the kind of like crazy pro-Trumpers, right? So on Facebook, you post something about, ah, oh, you're going to go crazy. It's like, I said, I said, you know what? The, the fact is that I respect every, I respect people who voted for Donald Trump as much as I respect everybody else because I respect democracy. And that is the way, because like not, you know, not everybody has the same opinion. Not everybody doesn't have, yeah. have the political leaning. If you cannot respect other persons, another person's political leaning, then, then I don't know. It's like, Although- you're not, you know, Although I would argue that democracy. I would argue that a lot of what Trump, his his instincts are illiberal though, and so it's, it doesn't it's, matter if it's liberal, but it's, it's just in a democracy. No, no, it's it, always it, going to be a continuum. No, no, but illiberal, like that. He's he's his a lot of his instincts are against democracy. Like it's not it's not democratic. But democracy is like a continuum, right? It's not like oh, you know, there's always going to be the more centric democracy. There's always the more left democracy, the more right. For example, like I would have voted for Bernie Sanders. Because, no, no, but no, sorry. But Bernie Sanders is not like he, everybody say, oh my God, he's a communist. Like he is oh. not like, you know, again, like this is what the DNC, the DNC. No, 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 no. Has, sorry, sorry. Sorry. When, when I say a liberal, I mean, I mean, authoritarian. It's, it's, he's not, his instincts. But again, like there's a continuum itself. in terms of democracy, right? Uh, there's some more know. authoritarian democracy, there's less authoritarian. Well, I mean, like as long as it's not like China, Russia, then it's fine. <laughs> you can't have an authoritarian democracy. Those are those are the no, opposite. It's, it's, when you say authoritarian, <laughs> is it? Do you mean that he controls the country more, or is it the government has more? You know, he's, but he's, but he's fundamentally also, he's fundamentally changing the what it you know like the role the different roles of government, and he's fundamentally that's all presidents do. Every nah, president not, not, the same. Not, like, not in the same looks, not in the same way. This is this is very different. I mean, in terms of. In terms of how he, uh, even his secretary, how he how he hire how he uh, nominates secretaries now, he doesn't nominate anymore. Um, just I mean, there's there's a ton of things that are, the way he does the ju- like the judges, he's ha- you know the way he does the it's very different than you know like for example like when Obama doesn't you know for example Obama or Ronald Reagan or Bush, they would find a secretary that would pass Congress, even if Congress was against them, they'd find somebody that would pass Congress. But now it's like well we're not even going through that process anymore. We've skipped the whole nominating process and we've gone straight into just, oh, he's an acting secretary of defense. He's an acting secretary of, which is just a way of saying like, I don't care. I don't need Congress anymore to say, you know, this person should be, I, I don't know. I, I, I agree with you. I think, I think it could go both ways, but I, I do think that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, he, he has a lot of leanings toward things that, that are very drastically different that have, that have fundamentally changed America. I'm more, I'm more worried about the next guy than I am worried about Trump himself. But, but I think that the ne- next guy not being Biden, but in general, just how things have changed so much. I mean, the president also has more power than he's ever had before. You know? So that's because of 911, though. No, no. 911 basically... No, yeah, that changed a lot. Yeah, yeah, but but it's now it's even more so. So I don't know. It's just a lot of things. It's a lot of very interesting things. But but thank you, Quentin. I, I really appreciate your time and and your advice, and uh, and we we will, and by the way, everyone, we uh, Quentin and I and this other uh, this actress name Jennifer Field, we do a podcast called Midnight Watchers where we look at midnight movies and we talk about those movies. And Quentin is, is one of my co-hosts on there. So if you have a chance, everybody, please listen to that. And please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye, guys.